Okay, hey guys, and welcome to week 74 of the underwaterrealm.com. Uh, you'll notice this week I am sat in this rather battered but rather lovely Spitfire. You'll remember maybe from weeks and weeks back when the team were building this, we called it the biggest Blue Peter project ever. And that's because this thing, although it looks incredibly realistic on camera, especially when you've got the camera here inside the cockpit, it's actually made of, of baked bean tins, tins of spam, we've got Pringles lids, we've got a bit of an old tripod, a magnifying glass. There's even a canister somewhere down here. I think I'm sat on it from an old 1970s soda stream. So it's a really a kind of a Heath Robinson, but it, on camera it just works beautifully, especially after the wonderful paint job that Shaz has done on it. And of course the shell itself is made of fiberglass. It's a cast uh, plug from an original Mark 5B Spitfire that was given to us from by the Spitfire Society who've been incredibly supportive. But I'm going to be talking this week about the shoots that we've done with this thing. In order to try and recreate a dogfight off the coast of North Africa between a Spitfire and a group of Messerschmitts, the Spitfire then eventually gets shot down and crashes into the water. But we don't end there. The Spitfire continues on its journey with the pilot still trapped inside as he comes to rest on the ocean floor and sees something that he was never expecting. So we had two major blocks of shooting. Of course there was going to be a fair amount of computer generated stuff in this one because we simply couldn't get dogfights between Messerschmitts and Spitfires or at least nothing quite as uh, let's say adrenaline fueled as we really wanted. So there's going to be a fair amount of CG but we wanted everything else to be just as, as real as possible. Hence starting with a full Spitfire. We actually found out during the casting process that one of the, the guys that we were auditioning, or screen testing in this case, had actually played a Spitfire pilot in Pearl Harbor for Michael Bay. Now, uh, we were a little bit apprehensive about bringing him along and uh, about how everything we were doing was going to compare, but as soon as we sat him in the seat, he was just like a kid in a candy shop. He was amazed by it, and we were all confused at this point. We were saying, well, you know, you've done all this before out of everybody. You're the one that's the old hat. And he said, no, 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 in, in Pearl Harbor, we had the seat and we had, you know, a bit of the canopy over the top of us, but then just a, a camera poking in our faces. You know, this is amazing. And, and I think that was, it was really reassuring to know that we were kind of taking it up a notch, even not looking for something that was just good enough to, to read on camera, because, of course, a lot of what we were filming was just what you'd see. But it was more than that. It was about getting the actor in the environment, everybody staying out of their eye line, rocking the canopy around, playing really, really loud music or sound effects from a dogfight, and really letting them get into character. I mean, come on, any any lad of the age of five or up has always done it, you know, sat down and pretend they've been shooting down Messerschmitts in the Battle of Britain. And that's what we wanted to really invoke. So it was, it was really reassuring to know that we were kind of punching at, at that sort of a level. We didn't end up actually casting that chap. We ended up working with a guy called Andy Torbit. And... Uh, Andy is just he's quite the action man. Um, he's, uh, he's a BBC presenter, among a number of other things, and his skills include being a fully qualified diver, cave diver, kayaker, rock climber, or you name it, he's done it. And, and so he was incredibly comfortable, especially once we got this thing underwater and he was having to do a, a little bit more action-oriented shooting. So two shoots. The first off was while we were still above the water. Now, in order to try and simulate the movements of the Spitfire itself, it was really important to get some really strong camera motion in there and obviously shoot against green screen. And in order to achieve this, we used Kessler's 18-foot crane. Kessler obviously being one of the backers of the team, uh, but we also had a fantastic toy on the end of it. It's a thing called a revolution head, again made by Kessler and sent over for use on the film. And this thing allows us to, to use a joystick to control the motion of the camera. And this it was actually quite surreal. At one point, we dropped the camera inside the cockpit on the end of the crane and I was sat there with a monitor and a joystick looking at the dashboard of a Spitfire. I could then tilt up and look out of the windows, look left to right and look down and I could even see Andy's legs, the pilot's legs and it was just like uh, the old days playing Microsoft Flight Simulator when I was a kid. It was, a, it was a really wonderful piece of kit. So a combination of that 18 foot crane and the revolution head allowed us to get some really fantastic dynamic shots and then a lot of work inside the canopy as well. But then we had to start working with water and this is where we really had to come up with some serious innovations. First of all we had to make it look as if the Spitfire had hit the water and started filling up really really fast. Now we couldn't do that underwater because it would mean keeping all the water out and then suddenly letting it all in which of course was going to be impossible in something with this many holes. But we started thinking about different ways we could do it and in the end we ended up working down at a, an industrial unit with the help of Dartmoor Engineering. We put together a system with a, a very very large water bowser that held almost a ton of water and then a very powerful three-phase water pump. 
and the hose just bolted straight into the front of a hole that we, we cut in the front of the Spitfire here, flicked it on, and in comes water. Incredibly, incredibly fast. We strapped Andy in and filled the thing up and had him reacting to all of that oncoming water. But that only got us so far. This thing springs leaks. It's, it's very, very difficult to make something like this completely waterproof because of the sheer force of the water. And so we could only get the water level up to around here. And then we took this Spitfire and somehow, I still can't quite figure out how we did it, on the last piece of principal photography, uh, along with a, a team of divers led by Rich Stevenson and Brian Stanislas, we put the whole thing underwater. We went back to CNC, that fantastic pool where we first learned to scuba dive, almost two years later, and dropped this thing in the deep end, quite literally, on a, an aluminium frame. We had air canisters underneath that could fill down to about here with air, and then we could let it out on a controlled valve and had a fantastic shoot during which Andy had to plummet down into the water in this thing with the air escaping, bashing against the sides. We then had the challenge of how to break out of that canopy. In the story, Andy's supposed to pull his revolver, service revolver, which is only really good for one shot underwater, hold it against the perspex, pull the trigger, and smash his way out of the canopy. Now that works great on paper and looks great in this previs, but when you actually have to achieve that in four meters of water in a confined space, it's, it's actually quite tricky. So we sent Rich Stevenson down with a hand drill and a chisel and a hammer, and he gradually made a tiny little crack the size of a bullet hole. And we're all there, fingers crossed, hoping that it's not too hard, not too strong, sit Andy in there and prep him for the shot. He's just pulled the trigger. He's almost deafened himself. His blood coming from his ears and one fist <laughs> punches straight through the canopy and the canopy fell away beautifully. It's one of those things where you only really have one shot because getting hold of an authentic Spitfire canopy from 1942 is, well, it's a pretty tall order, but breaking it apart looked wonderful on camera. It all worked just great and it was a wonderful end to principal photography. Now that's us for week 74 and we will catch you next week, week 75, where we're going to be going into depth and talking into depth, excuse the pun, we're going to be going in depth and talking about the art of underwater acting. So we're going to be looking at actors across the board, across the entire project and some of the amazing things that they've had to learn how to do and how to bring to camera while underwater. So we'll see you then at theunderwaterrealm.com.